This message has been brought to you freely by Ecclesia Kingdom Movement. To support our ministry and partner with us to increase our impact across the world, reach more people and take advantage of more platforms, we encourage you to consider making a monthly gift of any amount or one-time gift towards the work of the gospel. We'd like to thank you in advance for your support and we value your partnership. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this day. And thank you for this hour. Thank you for your presence. And thank you for your glory. I ask, oh God, that you will use these lips of clay to produce something that is worth the honor that it is to come and stand before you and your people to deliver your word today. I ask that you will speak forth words into the people's lives, words of life, words that will stay with them forever, words that we will be able to look back on and say, thank you, God. And at the end, let all the honor and the glory be unto you. In Jesus' name. Um, Thank you, Pastor Shepherd, for finding me worthy to stand here to give a word. Thank you, Pastor Paul and the rest of the leaders. Thank you. Um, So I was thinking um, when I found out that I would be giving a word, I was thinking, okay, what can I speak about? And nothing came to mind. And I was like, okay, God, what would you speak about? And he didn't say anything. And I was like, okay, I'll just wait till you decide to say something. And on Monday, because I sometimes I think that if you tell me to do something, you might just change your mind again. So I was hoping that Pastor Chippers would change his mind. But <laughs> didn't get any text, didn't get any phone call and nothing. So I was like, okay, God, um, your pastor says I should preach on Thursday. You have to give me a word. You have to give me something to talk about. And this is what I believe he gave me. And um, I would call it The way to Pentecost. That's what I'd call it, the way to Pentecost. Um, Oftentimes when we hear about Pentecost, all we think about is what happened in Acts chapter 2. But I'd like to open your eyes to what Pentecost really is and to share what I have learned and what I have come to know and what I believe God is saying. If we can turn our Bibles to Exodus 23. (laughs) Exodus 23, 14. Pentecost was first introduced in the Old Testament. That in Acts chapter 2 is not the first time we hear Pentecost. And I want to lay this foundation because I don't necessarily want to come and tell you stuff. I want you to understand the stuff that you're being told or the stuff that you're listening to. So I want to start from the Old Testament and work our way up to the New. Exodus 23 from verse 14. Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib 
for in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. And the feast of the harvest, the first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering at the end of the year. Then you have gathered in the fruit, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. Three times in the year, all your males shall appear before the Lord. And it goes and talks more about the feasts of the first, of, yeah, of the first fruits. Um, here it talks about the first three feasts. In somewhat. And I want to draw your attention to verse 16. And the feast of harvest. That feast is what we know as, past, as Pentecost. The feast of the harvest. The feast of harvest. Let's turn to Exodus 34. Bear that in mind, the feast of harvest. Exodus 34 from 21. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. And you shall observe the feast of weeks, of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. We've been taught before that there are seven feasts. And the first four comes during the spring and summer, near summertime. And the first four is Passover, the feast of Passover, the feast of unleavened bread, first fruit, and Pentecost. Here it mentions the feast of weeks which is another name for Pentecost. In the Greek, when you go on to find out what the weeks mean, it just means seven, is it seven? Yeah, it just means seven weeks. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy 16. This is where um, God speaks in detail about the feast. And I will start from verse 10, actually, verse 9. You shall count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. Then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a free will offering from your hand, which you shall give us as the Lord your God blesses you. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your gates, the stranger and the fatherless, and the widow who are among you at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days, when you have gathered, your, when you have gathered from your threshing floor and from your winepress. And you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, and the Levite, the stranger and the fatherless, and the widow who are within your gates." Seven days you shall keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands, so that you surely rejoice. Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Tabernacles, 
and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Pentecost was known as the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Harvest in the Old Testament. It came from when the Israelites went before God and God called Moses up to the mountain to give him the laws. In the Old Testament, that's what they celebrated it as, the coming of the law. And in the Old Testament, the Israelites were appointed these feasts and they were told to never appear before the Lord empty-handed during these feasts. Never appear before the Lord empty-handed. At Pentecost, we are never to appear before the Lord empty-handed. We are to go with an offering. From the scriptures that we've read, it speaks about it being a time where the Lord has blessed you in all your produce. So it's not talking about money now. It's talking about everything that you have. If you are alive, God has blessed you with breath. It's talking about every single thing that you can lay your hand on, not money. So I'm not talking about money now. I'm talking about your produce, everything that you have, everything that you can claim. Because sometimes some of us think, because we don't have money, we don't have anything. But you have your life. You have your legs. You have your hands. People don't have hands. Some people don't have legs. You have yours. That is what he's given you. That is an offering to give him. It said, do not appear before the Lord empty-handed. On Tuesday, we went for a leaders conference with where Bishop Tudor Bismarck was a speaker. And he said something. He said during times where he, um, back in Africa, I believe, um, he was preaching and he was talking about, God led him to speak about prosperity. And he was telling the people to give an offering to God. And many people didn't have money, but they had a watch. So they said in their hearts and in their minds, I'm going to give this as an offering. Produce is not money. So when people come and say, oh, give an offering to God, they're not saying bring your money. They're saying give an offering of your produce to God. Most of, our produce, most of our produce is money because we work for money. But what about the other things that he's given you? That is a produce that you can actually go before him and say, here it is, God. We are in the, the Bible speaks of presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. That is an offering. If you have absolutely nothing in life, you have nowhere to live, you have nothing to give, you literally... The clothes on your back is what you have. Your life is an offering. Anything you come into contact with, you can give as your offering. But I just want to make it clear that it is not talking about monetary offering. Pentecost is three days away. Is it three? It's three days away. Are you going to come empty-handed before the Lord? The Israelites didn't have a a one-on-one relationship with God. They didn't have a a time where they could go and say, I'm talking to the Lord. They were scared of him. He called them up, come let's talk. They ran away. They told Moses, you go and talk to your God and come and tell us what to do. You have an opportunity to sit down with your God on a daily basis and communicate with him and communion with him. Are you going to appear before that God empty-handed on the day he has said specifically, do not appear before me empty-handed? Sometimes we forget that the Bible is the Bible and it is God's word. 
And we forget that the Old Testament is as much valid, has as much validity as the New Testament. One thing I heard Pastor Paula White say was, we don't follow the feast religiously. We don't say seven days we come before the Lord, we go and we plant something and we come and this is what we have to do and this is what we have to do exactly like they did. But God said specifically, these times are the appointed times that I have called for you. In every Christian life, there are appointed times. There are times where God says, no, we're doing this. And these are the times where he's spoken and he said, no, we're doing this at this particular moment, moment in time. So it's not a thing of we're gonna, just going to follow the Old Testament or a thing of the Old Testament doesn't apply anymore. But there are some things that still apply to today. And I personally believe that you will be held accountable for the principle behind the feast. Jesus came to fulfill the law, came to redeem us from the law. But did he redeem us from this law? Did he? One thing I've realized, and I pray you you hear me by the Spirit. These feasts were not, they were not laws as such. They were, they were things, they were appointed times that God wanted to be able to communicate and to communion with his children at certain times. There were moments where God said, okay, you're scared of me, great. Let's set these times aside where it's going to be me and you. You're going to appear before me with an offering and I'm going to accept that offering and receive it. And that is how we're going to communion because you don't want to communion with me. So they're not laws as such. And so the, the thought or the... The idea that these are laws and Christ came to redeem us from the law so it doesn't apply now is not true and it's not valid because these are much more than laws. Feast of Weeks talks about a time... Actually, let me backtrack. From at Passover, we have salvation. At Passover, we are redeemed from sin. Christ died. At Passover, the Israelites were moved from Egypt into the wilderness. At Passover, we have found redemption. From Passover, a day after Passover, Passover is on the 14th, first fruit comes and that's the time God says bring your first fruit bring come with something that you can thank me with but at the same time sow the seed that thing you're coming with is more or less your seed to come and sow and 50 days after that There's going to be a time of harvest. And between first fruit, the barley season, into Pentecost, the wheat harvest, is 50 days. Wheat. When we we hear wheat, we hear grain. Wheat is used to represent a purging out, a cleansing, a testing, a purification process, a process where 
God takes you through things. A process where God strips away things. A process where God says, let's do this. Let's get you out clean. Let's, let's purify you. A process where God strips you of everything that you could possibly have. And he says, let's do this. You go through the process. From sowing the seed, you go through a process. And depending on how that process goes, depends on what will happen on the day of the harvest. In wheat, after the purging, after the polishing, there's increase and there's multiplication. You can never know how much something is worth to you. You can never know the value of something until you have gone through a process with it. If I have 50 pounds, I can never know how much that 50 pounds actually is, what the, the value of that 50 pounds until I lose it or until I have to sew it. When you don't have it anymore is when you think, oh my days, I wish I had that 50 pounds. When you don't have it anymore is when you think, when I had that 50 pounds, I could have done this and that. Now I don't have it anymore. Until you lose something, until something is no more, is when you realize how much of a value it was. We go through processes sometimes, and God takes us through processes sometimes to show us how valuable something is. If you go through a process and you come out not knowing the value of that particular process or what you had before that process began, you're going to have to go back through it again. Because there's no point in going through something if you don't come up with nothing. Everything we face in life produces a result. If... I'm trying to think of an example. If you're told, you know, you're someone who is not very confident, you don't really... You don't think you have a great voice to sing or anything. And you get told, go and lead music, worship today. And you go and you lead worship. And you come out the same. What did that do? It didn't do anything. You'll be told to do it again. But if you go and lead worship and you show a bit of confidence, you've accomplished something. Something has taken place. Something has happened. During... Passover, we don't know any better, so you know, we are redeemed, we are taken away from the things that we thought we knew. We move on to first fruits where we sow a seed unto God and wait for our harvest. 50 days between that and the harvest, you have the process. You have the process where you need to allow God to do whatever He wants to do, you need to submit to Him. And I have a question I'd like you to think about. Some of us sowed seeds during Passover and even at the beginning of the year. Are you going through your process diligently? Are you doing what he's asked you to do? Are you being submitted to the process that he's put you through? And what will you see in three days' time? And I like to say, if you haven't, you still got three days. If you haven't submitted to the process, you still have three days. And I'm not trying to be religious and say God can only do it in that third day. But there's a reason why it was called the day of Pentecost. There's a reason why it wasn't a seven-day celebration. There was a reason why it happened on one day and not three days. 
still have three days. <laughs> we can turn to Acts chapter 2. To the Passover that we all know about. Are we there? Acts chapter 2 from verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in, with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each each in our own language in which we were born? That's where I want to end. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Leading up to Pentecost, Jesus told his disciples, make sure you gather together in the upper room on that day. And I want to point out that Before Pentecost had come, they obeyed the instructions that they had been given. Would Pentecost have come? Would there have been a rushing mighty wind if they hadn't obeyed instructions? House of Ecclesia. We have heard so many things about Pentecost. First question. Are we going to be in one accord on that day? Are we going to appear as one before heaven on that day? Are we going to be in one place? The disciples trusted. They trusted their God. They trusted Jesus, the one that they had seen. They trusted the one who gave them the instructions. Without question, they obeyed. Without question, they went to do. Bearing in mind that After Jesus was resurrected, he spent 40 days with them. Before he spent those 40 days with them, they had all gone back to whatever it was that they were doing before Jesus appeared in the picture. After he had spent 40 days with them, he said, it is now time that I go. I send to my father in heaven. This was 10 days to Pentecost. So from that day, the disciples knew He said we should gather together in one place, in one accord. Scripture makes us understand that they went together in one accord, in one place, from that day. They didn't wait until the day before the day. They didn't delay. They went on that day 
together in one accord. They knew the time. They knew that they were to wait this many days. One did not say, oh, the Lord has not yet come, so let me go and get some food. One did not say, oh, he has not yet come, so let me go and get some water. Let me just lie down. They gathered in one accord, in one place, with one spirit, with one mindset, they gathered. To receive the promise that they had been given, they gathered. House of Ecclesia, we have heard so much. And we have been promised so much. And sometimes I personally think, God, I'm not seeing this that you've promised. When will I see it? And in this scripture lies the answer. Have we obeyed? Have we done all that we ought to do to be able to receive the things that he's spoken of? If they had not gone together in one accord, would the Holy Spirit come? Would he have come down like a mighty rushing wind? Jesus said, I go, that he may come. So surely he would have come, but just not to them. They were not the only Christians around. It says in the Bible, in verse 5, that, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. They were not the only people that were, that believed Christ. They were not the only people that believed in him. When Christ was on earth, a lot of people believed in him. The miracles, signs, and wonders caught people's attention. They understood if the population of Israel was 5,000 during that day, at least 2,500 believed him. 2,500 saw him. It was so great a multitude that the scribes and the Pharisees said, we must do something about this before this man comes and takes away if there were only two or 120, would, would they have bothered? It was great a number. That is why they were bothered. So these were not the only men that knew God. And yet, only 120, by Peter's count, were in the upper room. The upper room where they waited was a place of prayer an ascended place, a place where no, no one can come and disturb us. A place where we ate with our master. The last place we ate with him at. The last place we ate with him, we communed with him before he was killed. Before the day of Pentecost comes... Before that day arrives, have you been to the last place he communed with you? Have you spoken to him? Because sometimes it's, that, it's as simple as that. Have we actually spoken to God? You're expecting a blessing. You're expecting big things. Have you spoken to him about the big things you're expecting? Because sometimes we, we over-spiritualize and over-analyze certain things. If I said I'm going to give Pastor Shepherds 100 pounds tomorrow, and by today he has not come to say hi to me, or he's just being very, I don't want to be around you, will I give him the 100 pounds? I wouldn't. I would find someone else who deserves that hundred pounds. We all want houses and cars, and we want to be known. And deep down in your heart, you all know you want to be known. Let's not lie. You all know you want to be known. <laughs> if you want all of those things, because those things don't come cheap. If you want all of those things and the God that has promised to give them to you is standing by you and yet you don't turn around to say hi, how do you expect to get it? 
He says, so, and after a time, after a length of time, a harvest will come forth. And you don't want to sow, or you're grudgingly sowing. What are you going to reap? A grudging harvest? You might as well not have sown at all. Let's turn to John 7. And I want to say that being in the upper room was not the only instructions they obeyed. They were being thirsty. They were hungering and thirsting after that thing which they had been promised. John 7, 37. It says, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Thirty nine again. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. They thirst and they hungered after him. From the scripture, Jesus was saying that anyone who thirst can come to me and drink. Now, he was going up to be glorified and the Holy Spirit will come and take his place. If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He said, only if you thirst, will you come to me and drink. If the Holy Spirit would say, or if Jesus would say, if only you thirst for me is when I will come. You don't drink water when you're not thirsty. You don't drink water when you're not thirsty. You just sit there and wait to be thirsty to drink water. If he said only the thirsty, only the people who are thirsty would come to me to drink of me, Before he came, they must have been thirsty for him. They must have said, Holy Spirit, we want you. They must have said, that thing that Jesus promised, can we have it please because we need him. They must have said something because why go through the trouble of locking yourself up in an upper room when you don't really want what you've been promised? You don't really, you don't, you don't even know what you've been promised. So you're just there, you know. Whatever this promise comes, it comes. The promise would never come to you anyway. It would never come if God says, "Give thanks to me in your trouble," and in your trouble, you're just chewing mouth. You're just, you're just insulting people. You're just not doing the thing He asks you to do. How are you, how are you going to get out of that thing? And sometimes you've got to realize that it takes a thirst and a hunger to get that which we need. We're asking, today in service, we're asking the Holy Spirit to come. Did you really want him to come? Did you really know what you were talking about? Because sometimes we don't know what we're talking about. Sometimes we don't understand what we're saying. We've just heard it being said over and over again, so we decided to say it as well and recite it like a hymn. But do you really know what you're saying? Because if you don't, then ask to know what you're saying. Because if you do not desire to have him, he's not going to come for you. If you do not desire to be healed, you will not be healed. 
it's not about faith. It's more than faith. It's about actually saying, I want this. If you do not want it, you won't get it. At Pentecost, leading up to the day of Pentecost, if you do not want what he has to offer, you won't get it. If you do not want what he has to offer, he's not going to give it to you. He's a gracious God, yes. He's full of mercy, yes. But he's not stupid. He's not stupid. He's not silly. If he was silly, he would say, oh, you don't want me, but I'll come anyway. Only people who... Only people who have a point to make will go to someone, even if the person is saying, don't come near me. God is God. He's supreme. He's sovereign. He has no other point to make. He's made it. He's he's made it already. So if you do not want it, it's up to you. If you want it, it's up to you. He's promised for a day where he will send harvest. The day of Pentecost. He said, do these things. Because you need to qualify for this. This is not something that comes freely. You know, we can go and freely take. It's something that you need to qualify for. You can't not sow and expect a harvest. You can't not give to be given. It doesn't work that way. You got to sow to reap. Got a soul to reap. Final scripture I want us to read is Hebrews 11. This is kind of like a long scripture. I'm going to start reading because it's quite a long scripture. Hebrews 11 from verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must come, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised." Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in the multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Seventeen. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. 
And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was called, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him, even from the dead from which he was, he also received him in a figurative sense. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. This scripture speaks about faith. And that is more or less my last point. From the time of Passover, first fruits to Pentecost. They were building up their faith. The reason I say this is before Jesus died, Peter was one who was quick to speak. He was one who could who thought he could do anything and everything for Jesus. And yet at the point in time where we expected him to do something. He becomes a coward who goes, who does not do according to his say, what he says, but that's the total opposite of it. After Jesus dies, he returns back to his boat. Jesus comes back and revives that passion Revives that that need that was always there but was covered because he did not know. And it brings him to a place where he sees differently now. It brings him to a place where Peter can boldly stand and speak in front of multitudes. And yet the Holy Spirit was not poured out yet. Ten days to go to Pentecost. Peter gathers. They gather themselves to go to the upper room. Why did Peter return to his boat? Why did he return to his fishing occupation? Peter fell into something that we often fall into, even in the new century. So God said, there will come a time where the things that you said you would do, you would not do anymore. And it comes a time where you did not do it. Or you said, oh, I'm going to pray at 6 a.m. And you don't even wake up at 6 a.m. You wake up at 11 And all of a sudden, there's a guilt that just arises. And it just eats eats you up. And because of that guilt, you're like, okay, I'm going to try again tomorrow. And the same thing happens. Still guilt, more guilt. You remember the things of yesterday. Third day, same thing. Fourth day, same thing. And you let that guilt eat you away. God knew you were not able to do it in your your own strength in the first place. If he knew you were going to be able to wake up at 6 a.m., why would he tell you to wake up at 6 a.m.? And that begs the question, is it something that you want to do for him in your own strength? Or is it something that you have asked for his grace to be able to do? Or is it something that he's required of you? Because sometimes we do things in our own strength and we think God has said to do them. But what God says, what God speaks... He backs up. What God speaks, he gives grace to be able to do. What God ordains, he makes sure that there's a way for it to happen. Did God ordain you to wake up at 6 a.m.? Have you asked for grace to wake up at 6 a.m.? Because it's not everything that God needs to ordain from you or expect of you or speak of you for you to do. Sometimes you can just go and say, God, because I love you so much, I want to do this for you. But have you asked for his hand in the matter? Have you asked for his grace to help you? 
Peter was, was at a place where after Jesus had come back from the dead, he was like, okay, I'm going to try this again. I learned, my, I learned my lesson the first time around. If you realize, he never spoke out of turn after Jesus rose up from the dead, resurrected. He never spoke out of turn. Something had happened to him. His ego had fallen away. His pride had died. His flesh had been killed. And this leads me on to my point. Yes, Christ resurrected for us. And we died with him. And we rose up with him. But at the same time, are you dead? Are you truly dead? When the issues of life comes at us day in, day out, do we remain in a state where our flesh is dead? Because this is not a one-day thing. It's a state of being where you're at a place where you can't do it. God can. Because if you're not at that place, you're not going to receive that which you so readily desire at Pentecost. If you can't trust God to do what he said he would do, if you don't have faith in the things that he said he would do, if you have not killed off that flesh that tells you, will he really? Am I really going to get this? You're not going to get it. Because it takes total trust and dependence on God to receive from him. It was only when Abraham came to his senses and said, I can't do this thing anymore. I've tried, it failed, I'm done. Was when God gave him a son. At Pentecost, all your flesh, the old man must have been put away. Would the Holy Spirit had come if Jesus was still alive? No, because he said it. It was only after a resurrection that he came. It was only after there was a new man. It was only after there was an ascension. It was only after canality had died. It was only after there was a release of grace. It was only after there was salvation and faith to be able to stretch up high for him to say, receive this. Because if he had given the Holy Spirit to them, while they were still who they were, they would have quenched the Spirit. They would have quenched the Spirit so bad that God would have to say, we need to find another plan to do this thing. Because if you quench the Spirit, how are you going to hear from the Spirit? In Acts chapter 2, let me go back there. And I'm rounding up now. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, um, I'll start reading from 7. You don't have to turn there. And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in you. In his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. One thing we forget is the Holy Spirit didn't come down just for them to speak in different, different languages and tongues. The Holy Spirit came much more so that they may have power to do, power to further the kingdom. And most of us can speak in tongues very loudly. Most of us know what we're saying sometimes. That's not all there is to salvation. That's not all there is. There is so much more when you go behind, like after salvation, you go and you say, Holy Spirit, give me this thing. Like, 
I want more of you. For some of us, every time we go to God and we say we want more of him, he, he gives you something. He gives you a taster. And that taster is like nothing you've ever experienced before. And then we go and we like the taster and we're like, okay, I want more of you. And then he starts to give you an instruction. But you don't follow it and you go back to him. I want more of you. Do this thing and you have more of me. You don't do it, you go back to him. I want more of you. Go through the same cycle over and over again. He says, go speak to someone. You come and you're like, but I want more of you. I want to be heard. I want power to do things. I want to heal. I want, I want miracles, signs and wonders to follow me where you are. Just go and speak to one person. You recite the same prayer over again. Speak to one person. You don't do that, you go ahead and recite this whole prayer. Signs and wonders are not going to follow you. Because he only gave power so that they could go. And at Pentecost, that's what, that's what happened. Aside from the tongues, aside from the new language, the thing that amazed the others, the things that drew attention to them, apart from all of that, he gave them power. Power so much that Peter was bold to speak and say, <laughs> say so much. Let's put it that way. So much power that they were able to go and heal. That they were able to say, demon, stop talking now. And they stopped talking. So much power that they were able to say, we go here. We know that there's death here, but we choose to go because that's where the Lord has sent us. If they had not spent time, that week time, if they had not spent that time, that time getting purged, that time reading the Bible, that time getting cleansed, that time rechanging and refocusing their mind and their attention, if they hadn't gone through that week process, it would have been a waste. We know from the Bible that it says, one of the parables God gave, Jesus gave, and he said, let the tares and the wheat grow up together. And we understand that only when they grow up together, after they have grown, is it more easy? Is it more, what's the word? After only when they have grown together, can you gently pick out the tares and throw them away or harvest the wheat we've been hearing that God is going to separate a chaff from the wheat that happens at Pentecost when the tares and the wheat have grown up together when your sorrow has become so much that you think is unbearable when the time of pain has exceeded what you, what you thought only then, when your faith has been built to a place where you think and you're like, after all of that, I'm still here. Only when they have grown up together can they be differentiated. Only when have your troubles come together, have your troubles ascended up on high, can God come and speak for you. I've come to realize that the tears are a good thing, that the troubles are a good thing, that the problems are a good thing, that the insults are good. Because at the end of the day, it's all for his glory. And only if you can put up with that will you be glorified in the end. Only when you can be put when you can put up with these issues of life that we face. And move on, even through it. And keep going. Keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus. Are you able to get to the end where you can say, here's my harvest. Because God will not give you anything that you don't, you don't. 
I know there's grace, but God will not give you something that you really do not deserve and you're not going to have any value for. His son was valuable. A lot of people don't have value for it. But we do. And because we do, it's what keeps it's what keeps us going and puts a smile on the father's face because I've got a group of people who actually believe that my sacrifice was not a waste. They have value for it. If you don't have value for something, whether promised or not, you will not get it. And what I came here to say tonight is what are the things that you have been told to do? What is the seed that you have been told to sow? Because as I said from the beginning, it's not all about money. It's about produce. He said, do not appear before me empty-handed. If God says do not, is do not. It's not a maybe. It's do not. So on Sunday, what are you going to come to him with? What are you going to appear before him with? And not that, even though, you know, feel free to do that. But what are you going to come to him with? At Pentecost, it's a new season. It's almost as if the cycle repeats itself, it just starts again. But are you going to be at the same place? Or are you going to move on to greater things? Are you going to ascend or are you going to stay where you are? Are you going to have an overflow? Or are you just going to be one of those who are always looking for the people of the overflow to go and get from? We're in a wheat season. A season where there is purging. A season where there is being set apart. A season where there is being cleansed. Are you going to diligently go through that season? And wait the 50 days. And sometimes it's not 50 days. Sometimes it's years. But are you going to wait your time to receive the harvest in the end? Or are you going to say, God, I know this is Pentecost, but grace. Let grace prevail for me. Or are you actually going to do something about what you've heard today? Pentecost is not just about 50 days. It's not just about seven weeks. It's about, like the Israelites did, coming to God in thanksgiving to present something to him. It's about diligently obeying the things he has spoken about. It's doing the things that he has commanded celebrating the fact that his son rose up for something greater and something better and by celebrating the Holy Spirit because without him we're nothing can't do anything Father thank you for today Thank you for Pentecost. A time where it's not just about the receiving of tongues or clothing fire on their heads, the manifestation of just the tongues and the spirit has come forth. But it's a time of greater things that we are yet to uncover. Thank you for including us in such a feast. Thank you for making an appointed time where we come to you with thanksgiving to offer something, to offer something that is worth something to us. Unto you. Let us not just be another sermon, but I ask that let us be far more, let it bear far more fruits than we've ever had before. Three days to go, God, until the day, the appointed day. I ask 
that let it be let it be worth something let it count for something that these are not just mere words that came out of my mouth but it's spirit and life and i ask oh god that as your people have listened that they will find its ground and that they will bear fruit in jesus name this message has been brought to you freely by ecclesia kingdom movement to support our ministry and partner with us to increase our impact across the world reach more people and take advantage of more platforms we encourage you to consider making a monthly gift of any amount or one-time gift towards the work of the gospel we'd like to thank you in advance for your support and we value your partnership